Well, good morning, saints of God and those welcoming us in the live streaming. I want to welcome any first-time guests. We're grateful to have you with us. Uh, my heart has been blessed by some of the new brothers and sisters that God has been bringing to our body during this season. And comments has been just your love for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so grateful to have you with us. We're studying through the book of Romans. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 4, we're going to continue there this morning. And by way of introduction, as we've been looking at this section on Abraham, I just want to give you kind of a, a bird's eye view of your Bible and how this all fits in and ties together. So before we go back into the trees, I just kind of want to give you the forest of Abraham's faith that Paul is teaching in this chapter. A friend of mine kind of helped me journey through this outline, and I want to borrow some of his thoughts this morning. The Bible is God's story. It's not just a bunch of ancient stories put together in a book, but there's really four main themes that make up the storyline of the Bible, and we call it redemptive history. We have God creating. We have the fall. And then there's a promise of redemption that's flushed out through the rest of our Bible, culminating in new creation with the new heavens and a new earth. And so just kind of one important note as we begin, the main character in this story is not you, but rather it's the promise. It's the, the God of promise. It's the triune God. It's the Father who is the, the promise maker, promise keeper. The Son of God is the promised one. And the Spirit is the Spirit of promise. And so in this book, the God of promise unfolds His plan uh, that was made before the foundation of the world. And so it's a, a promised plan. In the Old Testament, the promised plan of God is revealed to us. And in the New Testament, the, the plan is fulfilled in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And as we journey all the Bible, God gives promises, and His promises are always sure because He's always faithful. The faithful God makes promises and He keeps them all and He will keep all of them. And He calls His people, the, the called out ones, He calls us to faith. The just shall live by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so through His Word, the promises of God and faith, they just go together. We are to live the life of faith together. Faith that God is. He's true. He's trustworthy. He's reliable in this promise that He's given us in redemption. And so this God created the world and it was good. It's created to reflect His glory. And man and woman were made to image God and they were put in paradise with God. And then came the fall. Sin and death entered into this creation. And in Genesis 3, the paradise of God now becomes paradise lost. And Adam is banished from God's presence. And now we come into the world with the guilt of sin, the weight, the shame, and the deterioration that has come from the fall and the curse. The whole creation is groaning, anxiously awaiting its redemption. And redemption is the trajectory of the whole Bible. And Genesis 1-11 through lays that foundation. Then in Genesis 12, God calls out an idol worshiper out of paganism, and He calls them with a promise. I will give you a land and seed. Your descendants will be very, very numerous. And he becomes the father of the nation of Israel to be God's firstborn son. But this nation could not shake the rebellion of the fall. And it's really a history of sin and idolatry. And so the law then was given to Israel 400 years after the promise that was made to Abraham. And the law was not a new way to get right with God. The law was to be a tutor. It was to be preparatory for the coming of God's Son into the world who would come in and He'd be born of a virgin and He'll die on a cross and be buried and be raised to accomplish God's redemption that He has promised. So God through Jesus is restoring all that was lost in Adam. And so God fulfills His promise with the Son of God and Jesus inaugurates the fulfillment, the, the new covenant that we live in this morning. And now we live on the other side of the cross. And we're eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus to consummate all things and to make a new heavens and a new earth 
where righteousness dwells and all his enemies will be put down forever. And so the message of the Bible is that this is our hope. This is where all of history is moving. And so justification is that what we have been studying and laboring in Romans is, praise God, it's leading to something really big where Jesus is going to reign from shore to shore in this new heavens and new earth and He will be worshipped and adored. That's where all of this is going to go. And so Abraham believed God in this shadowy promise that I'm talking about now. And when he believed God, he was justified. And we're told this morning he, he gets the inheritance by his faith. And so we now believe in this colored out promise of, of the seed that, that Sean just read in Galatians, that's singular, that would be Jesus Christ and he would come in the world and we believe the promise in him and we're justified, we're made right with God through faith and we inherit the promise. That's the promise of this Bible. And so let's this morning then continue our study in the life of faith in the God of promise. The God of promise. And I just see kind of two types of people attending Southside Bible Church. Those who have the faith of Abraham and they get this promise and they understand it's all of grace and they're just bearing the fruit of the Spirit as just coming out of this faith of love and joy and peace and patience. And it's just beautiful to watch. And then there are those who still have faith plus works to get right with God. And they don't have joy. And they don't have peace. And they're easily knocked down. And they can't get any footing because every time I blow it or struggle, I'm, I'm already back to doubting the promise of God. And so my prayer this morning is that every one of you would have the faith of Abraham as we look at the seed this morning. And we're going to go to the table and remember the seed whose, whose body was broken on our behalf and His blood was spilled out for our atonement. And thus we can inherit the promise of God because of this work of Jesus Christ. And so let's join our hearts together and pray for this. Father, I thank You for this big picture. And I thank You that You are the God of promise. And I thank You that it's a promise that comes to us by grace through faith. And I pray for any who still are, are under the law. God, I ask for their freedom this morning. I pray that the sons of God would see the fullness. The sons and daughters of God would see the fullness of what we have in the seed and the promise of God and where all this is going, Lord, that we would be taken up with the inheritance. Lord, that we wouldn't try to make America paradise. We wouldn't put our tent stakes down here. But God, our hope is in the promise. And so Lord, lift our hope in our eyes and let it have its way in us to lose our lives on this earth for the King of Kings and the fulfilled promise that's coming. So God, let us look by faith at this promise and not by sight. And God, meet us here this morning and let this now be a sweet time of worship as the body of Christ. And it's in Your name, the precious name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Paul's focus through this section has been sola fide. He's laboring hard to show us that this gift of God is coming through faith. The whole Judaistic system at Paul's time of writing was banking <coughs> that their salvation upon some really big pillars. And they're all pointing to their, to their, to their father Abraham. And Paul's been removing a lot of these foundations that they were falsely hoping in. In verses 1-8, through eight, they were hoping, uh, he shows that you're saved by faith apart from your works. And they said it was Abraham's works that got him right with God. In verses 9-12, through 12, they, they were believing that circumcision is how you get into God's people. And, and uh, Paul showed us that it's apart from circumcision. In verses 13-17 through 17 this morning now, faith is apart from the law. And then next week, we'll see that faith is apart from sight. It's just believing the bare Word of God and we will look at Father Abraham again next week. 
So the outline for this morning is Paul gives us four reasons as to why the promise comes by faith and not by law. And he's going to give us a presupposition, a problem, the penalty, and power. And in verse 13, let's begin with the presupposition. For the promise of Abraham, promise to Abraham or to his descendants, that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Subject in verse 13 is the promise. The verb was not through the law. Preposition phrase, the, the promise was not through the law. And there's a, this Allah, which is the strong adversative in the Greek, to say, but, but rather, on the complete opposite, it's through the righteousness of faith. So it's, it's, the promise isn't going to come through law. It's going to come through everything we've been studying, the righteousness that God gives through faith. A literal translation would be not through law, the promise. He's very drawing it out so you can't miss it. And so Paul here is after showing the Jew then, it's not by Torah that you get right with God. And the crazy part is that at the time that Paul was writing, it was taught that Abraham got right with God by keeping the law. And so what would be your argument to that? Well, last week we saw it was simple. Abraham was justified by faith and 14 years later he was given circumcision. Well, how about Abraham's justified by faith and that's 400 years later comes the giving of the law at Sinai. Paul uses that argument in Galatians that Sean just read, but he doesn't do it here. And so let's try to understand it. <clears throat> that is what he, he uh, my question is, why does he not do that here? And let's look at it and try to understand what Paul's after in this argument. So look with me in verse 13, the promise. This is beautiful. It just keeps flushing out the beauty of this promise that comes to us by faith. It was the promise that was made to Abraham that we read in Genesis 12. That his descendants and all his all-believing seed and the faith of Abraham, that they would be, what does it say, the heir of the world. And you can't really find that exact wording in any of the promises that were made to Abraham. But the concept was in every uh, promise that God made to him. And I just want to read two of them to you in Genesis 12, 3. God says, Abram, I will bless those who bless you. And the one who cursed you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All, all the nations, all the families are going to be blessed through you. Another way of saying the whole world. Genesis 15, 5. God took Abram outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And so the Pauline teaching here now, as he says this promise that you would be the heir of the world. Us in Christ has a promise of worldwide dominion. John Murray said it's a promise that receives its ultimate fulfillment then in the new heavens and in the new earth. Hebrews 1-2, in these last days, God has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the world. And so there's this inheritance that we have in Christ, you're going to inherit the whole world. In 1 Peter 1, 4, he said you're going to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So we have this incredible inheritance at the end, this promise that God has made that in Christ we're going to be heirs of the world. Galatians 3, 29, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring Heirs according to promise. In Revelation 3.21, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. So meditate on this truth. The promise is an inheritance that you're going to inherit the whole world. And so there, there, this is to, to, to strengthen you in your journey to glory. It's to say, I, don't, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared 
with this glory that's going to be revealed and this promise of the new heavens and the new earth and what's coming for the children of God. So it, it's to have a sanctifying, powerful effect on you this morning. But I want you to consider one more thing. God gave to Abraham a land promise. He gave its dimensions. Israel would be a land flowing with milk and honey throughout the Old Testament. It was going to be a great blessing to Israel as God brought them in. <clears throat> Yet the writer of Hebrews brings us into Abraham's thinking in regards to the promise of God. And I want to read to you Hebrews 11, 8 through 10 as we flush this out. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, so we're right back to Genesis 12, he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, but by faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Verse 16 of that chapter, But as it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one, Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for He's prepared a city for them. And so I want you to see this ultra-fulfillment of the inheritance that's promised to Abraham. The land promises make up a big piece of Israel's history. But what I want you to see here is this ultra-fulfillment that Paul's bringing out. You're going to be an heir of the whole world. You're going to be an heir of the new heavens and the new earth that are going to come down from heaven. The great promise of God that all of history is moving to. And so I want you to let this take your breath away because the, the beauty of this promise that God has given to us, it doesn't come by law, it comes by faith. I just look at such a beautiful promise of our inheritance of being heirs of the world. It's just this unbelievable promise that God would give to anyone and then to say, you don't work for it, it's a gift. This inheritance is not going to become yours, please hear this, by striving harder, by giving more money, by feeding the poor, having kids with good manners and going to the mission field. All of these things are not going to get you the inheritance. Their faithfulness, yeah, but they are not what gets you the inheritance. And some of you just need to hear this this morning. You're justified not by being a working one that we looked at a few weeks ago. You don't get right with God by being a working one, but you believe in Him who justifies the ungodly. So in all of my ungodliness, I look to God and His promise, and I believe by faith without trying to work and change my life and get acceptable to God. That was a life changer for me. But I needed this last piece because as I think about this promise and how grand and beautiful it is and the way it's described in Revelation and throughout the Scriptures, <clears throat> I just feel like i got to be a working one. I just look at it and say, it's just too beautiful. i got to be a working one to get that inheritance. Anyone else ever battle with that? i got to preach. i got to read and share the Gospel and hand out Bibles and Grow in godliness and grow in trust and love if I get the inheritance. And that is to put it back in the foundation again that we looked at last week. To me receiving the promise of God forever in the new heavens and the new earth, the heavenly Jerusalem that will come down. That I have to perform and earn to get that. And so I want you to hear what he's saying is beautiful this morning. Believe the just shall live by faith in this promise. He says the way you get the inheritance is by looking away from anything in you and to believe this bare gospel. And so I tell you, your best life is not now. It's in this promise. And who wants to live upon this? Who wants to lose their life for this promise? To the fulfiller of this promise to tell it to the nations, to try to quit holding to this world for your health 
and your acceptance in it and your approval and just fighting in this world. Who wants to make this your supreme hope? A gathering of a people of God every Sunday, all throughout the week. What would happen if we were a people that believed this message? That Abraham believed God and he was justified. And your inheritance that God has promised that He will keep, He's going to give to you by faith. Not by your performance. And we're going to see in a few verses so that you can be certain. If I was seeking for a better America, I have no hope. But I'm seeking for a better country. That is a heavenly one. That's why guys who leave America, whoa, and come back, and they suffer, and they're persecuted, and the trials of day-to-day life just to survive with existence. And they come back and they stand up here and close the service and say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Your hope is not this dying country, but to be heirs of the world when this is all over. Go point the world to your blessed hope. But first, you've got to believe and live into your blessed hope. And if you're sitting under the law, never being able to rest in this inheritance because you just can't do enough and you keep coming short, you will never live the fullness of what God has promised. You're you're living like He's a liar. You're living like it's by law that you get this inheritance. And so this is a call to have the faith of Abraham and to believe the bare Word of God and what He says. Amen? Not just for justification but for your inheritance. (laughs) That was so sweet for me this week to drink from that promise. So that's your first point. That's our presupposition. Verse 13. And now Paul's going to show us the problem in verse 14. And notice every verse in 13 through 16 starts with a four. It's all argumentative and proving and showing points. For if those who are of the law are heirs, of this promise that we just talked about. Faith is made void and the promise is nullified. And so if you can get this promise by law, by law keeping, two things are going to happen. First, faith is going to be made void. The, The law always is interested in works. Do this and don't do that. Keep it. As Sean read, you got to keep it perfectly. The law commands things and it prohibits others. Do and receive. Remember in Romans 4.4 is if you're a working one, it's the wage that you earn, but the one who doesn't work, it's by grace. And so faith and law to get right with God, they're just opposites. They they can't go together. Romans 10.4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes it, it's, it, the law's done. It served its purpose then. And if you're to get these promises then by law keeping, faith is banished. They're not a marriage, they're a divorce. Paul's going to say in verse 16, a marriage is faith and grace. But faith and law are just opposites. They cannot dwell together. Faith and law keeping cannot coexist. They break the plan and the promise of God. They just destroy it. Law is man-directed, human abilities. Faith is God-directed that He will keep the promise and He will do what is necessary to bring us into a relationship with Himself. So if you're approaching this inheritance by trusting in yourself and what you are doing, you cannot be trusting God alone. If there's 1% of your doing to get right with God or get this promise, you make faith void and it's no good and it's no use. And secondly, then, the promise is nullified. If the promise in our text is linked to the law principle, then a person must keep the whole law to receive the promise. And the promise then would be conditional. Abraham, if you keep the law... I will give you an inheritance. And I'm just so glad he didn't do that because I'm terrible at it. And the problem with this, Paul just spent three chapters showing you 
that no one can keep the law. No flesh will ever be justified in His sight by keeping law. Three chapters to show you it isn't going to happen. And if you want to go to the law to get your inheritance, the promise is nullified. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it's God putting out His promise with His right hand and taking it back with His left. If I said if you flap your arms and fly to the moon, I'll give you a million dollars. What a placebo of a promise if it comes to you by law. Well, Pastor, why, why all the fuss? Why do you keep fighting this and arguing with this? Well, I want you to turn to our third point. <coughs> our third point is the penalty in verse 15. For the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there's also no violation. So I want you to just look at the penalty. The law works wrath. In verse 14, we saw what we failed to achieve. We failed to achieve the promise. In verse 15, we see what we do achieve. And I want you to hear this. All of your striving, all of your work, and blood, sweat, and tears to obey God, to get right with Him. This is saying you will lie down in torment. This isn't little. This is an eternal mistake that you just can't afford to make. Some of you think it's just a sin that i got to work at. i got to get rid of trying to get right with God by law and doing. What Paul's telling you this morning is you need to lay it down. The law can only condemn. It's holy, righteous, and good. It's not a chin-up bar. It possesses nothing to enable you to keep its demands. All it does, as Paul said in Romans 1.18-3.20, it brings about wrath. In Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. All this law will ever bring is the wrath of God because it's now a violation. It's transgression. The law has been given. And you're transgressing God and it brings His wrath. And so I want you to see this is a big deal. If you want to stay under this law and keep trying to perform and be a good little boy or girl and keep all the the rules to get God to love you and accept you, this brings wrath. And so we got to wrestle and we got to fight with this and we can't just accept this kind of thinking. And that's why Paul is, is wrestling in a whole extra chapter. He should have just went to Romans 5 after chapter 3, but he had to go after the skin these cats and undo the wrong thinking of chapter 4 with Judaism. So I want you to hear this. If you look to the law to receive the promise, it won't bring you the promised blessing, but it will bring you the wrath of God. I want you to picture if you're drowning and someone throws you a life preserver and the name of that preserver is law. It's all it's going to do is grab you and dunk you all the way under and drown you. It'll destroy you. And some of you, it's your daily bread. And I want you to be set free from it this morning. There's a life preserver called faith in God's promise in Jesus Christ to rescue you from yourselves, your sin, the wrath of God, and death. What a promise. And so I offer you something better this morning in my fourth point is I want you to look at the power. The power. And I think I'm going to just skip my notes. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it might be in accordance with grace, that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, Jew and Gentile, not only to those who are of the law, but those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And so what I want you to see then is what we learned in Romans 3 is that this is all of grace. Do you remember 3.24? Romans 3.24, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And so God's plan when he made a promise to Abraham is that I'll I'll do all of necessary 
to bring you into a relationship with me. You remember walking through the animals, just God went through that covenant. And so God's the one who's going to fulfill everything necessary for this to take place. So God's desire, as we're going to see in Romans 11, this whole thing is building for from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. God's desired plan is that He's glorified and worshipped for this plan for all of eternity. And so the only way this glory works is if it accords with grace. And so God desires that it be a gift. He desires that it's all of His doing. You're the receiver and He's the giver. That's the whole plan of God. And so what He's saying then is if I want to give you a gift and be the one who accomplishes everything in this covenant, I need to give it to you. And if it works, it's never going to (laughs) work. It'll never be. You can't add works to this gift. And so it's just contrary. Law will never, ever fit with God's plan. That's not good. It's a good thing I wasn't going to use them. It's never going to work with God's plan. It just, it's contrary. It can't happen. And so what, what can work with the plan of God? An empty hand. It looks to God alone and believes the God of promise and what he has said and what he has done in the seed. The one who sent his son into this world and fulfilled the law, lived the life of righteousness that you should have, and he hung on a cross for every transgression that you ever committed, and he bore the wrath of God on that cross, and he was buried and raised in victory, and God saying, this is the seed that I will justify you if you believe in him. And so the only thing that can ever work with grace is faith. Faith and the redemption that Jesus Christ has paid by being a propitiation on the cross. It's a marriage made in heaven, and I want you to hear what comes from that. So that you might be certain. God doesn't want you, if it's law, you can never be certain. I lived under that for half my life. And you just always thought, have I done enough? And every time an airplane started to drop or you had a mole that popped up and you were worried about melanoma or whatever, you always just sat there with fear. Have I done enough? Is God happy with me? God, give me more years so I can do more. And you just live in that fear and that anxiety and you can't walk into death grinning because it's all as well with my soul. And so I I, I can't be certain because I got works in this promise and this inheritance. I believe in Jesus, but I got 10% works that, that helped me to get my assurance. And I'm telling you, if you add any bit of works, you break the whole plan of God. He doesn't get the glory in that. It's 0% you. Your faith is a gift from God. He gets all the thanks, all the praise, and all the glory. And so it's got to be grace And it's got to be faith alone. Hear this. So this morning you could be certain. You can be absolutely certain because God raised them from the dead and said His works were enough. I'm satisfied. My wrath is appeased. And if you will believe in Him, you will have eternal life. And you you can be absolutely certain as you gaze in Christ instead of the law and your own performance. And so I want you to stare at Jesus Christ for your justification and for the promise of what is coming at the end of all this, the summing up of everything in Christ, the new heavens and the new earth. I get to be a part of that because of the work of Jesus Christ. And I believed God. And it was credited to me as righteousness. And now I can be certain of my inheritance. You know what that does? It sets you free from the fear of death that you were held all of your days. You can be set free now to go live a life for God and others. Because you're not afraid. I've been set free from the bondage of the fear of death. And, And maybe this last six, seven, eight months, you've just been locked in because there's a fear of death. And I want something better for you. 
I want you to be set free, that you could be certain as you sit here this morning, not because of have I done enough. I know he did enough because God raised him up and he was the son of God who perfectly fulfilled the law. I am so stinking certain because of Jesus Christ. And let that bring freedom into the sons of God this morning. Amen. I'm going to close with a statement by Donald Gray Barnhouse. He said, The law is the womb of doubt. And anyone who is attached to the law or its works is going to be besieged by all of the doubts which are born from the law. Any individual who has his eyes upon himself will be miserable. Let me say it again. Any individual who has his eyes upon himself will be miserable. The man who walks by the law walks in the night and his footsteps echo against the wall of the darkness that goes with the law. These echoes rise to his ears and each sound from all the troop of doubts gives him fear upon fear. Just fear upon fear upon fear. <clears throat> if he pauses, which our whole society is made to not pause and not have quiet, He's in the silence of dread fears. And as he runs from them, his footsteps echo all the faster while the increasing tempo of, with hysteria of doubt. But the man who walks by the promise of grace walks in the broad day. And his footsteps echo against the light of the promises of God. And he feels himself to be surrounded by the angels of blessing. His eager steps press forward to claim the blessings. And the increasing tempo of his footsteps set up the echoes for further blessings. If he stops, he finds himself in green pastures and beside still waters. When he walks again, he's in the path of righteousness. He hastens on to the golden city. And the brightness of its prospect takes away any sense of fatigue that might naturally rise from the length of the road. And when the road ends, he finds that he has been supplied with grace at every step and brought on to triumph of life eternal. Dear saints of God, your salvation is not based upon your working. It's not based upon your circumcision, your heritage. It's not based upon your law keeping. It's not based upon having the blood of Abraham run through your veins but it's based upon having His faith in your heart who looks away from anything in you and looks to a dead corpse hanging on a cross saying it is finished. And the difference is eternal wrath to inherit the new heavens and the new earth where Christ will be. And the difference between these two is faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And so shall we go to the table and remember our, our Christ, our sweet Savior, our head, who was broken and spilled out so that we could receive a promise. And as we remember this morning, we can be certain of our rightness with God and our inheritance that's soon to follow. I love this gospel. I hate every bit of my flesh that looks at it with unbelief. And I, I pray for more faith. And if you've come here this morning and you are an unbeliever, I want you to hear me. I know it's scary if you've spent your whole life holding on to just being a good kid. Church, nice. Have a Bible. I'm right with God because I got baptized. I'm better than other people. I'm just a good girl. I go to church. My parents are missionaries. I'm a virgin. I try hard. I'm kind to people. It can bring panic when someone stands and tells you that's going to bring the wrath of God upon you. But I want you to hear this morning there's a Christ ready to catch you if you will let go of that. 
you'll let go of the things that bring about wrath. Trying to get right with God through merit and works and law. And look that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to fall on Him and fall on Him alone for your rightness with God. Lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in Him and Him alone, gloriously complete by faith alone. And so I pray for any, uh, any of the kids. I, I just, if you've been just raised in a family that it's, it's really easy to just say I'm a good boy and I'm a good girl and I do all the right things. And you're looking at all of that for your salvation this morning. I'm offering to the, to the little kids, anyone doing that, there's a Jesus who already did it all. And He's offering you to believe in Him for your rightness with God versus just being a good kid. And so I, I pray for all of our children. Jesus says, come to me. And, and, and all who are weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest for your souls. And I, I pray for our older kids, our 70, 80 year olds, if you're doing the exact same thing, there's a, there's a free gospel of Jesus Christ and it costs God everything and I want you to believe. Repent and believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we move now, justification does not do away with faithful living to our God, but it establishes it and it empowers it. And as we progress, we're going to learn how this works, but I'm telling you the foundation is Christ alone. And I pray that all of us have faith in that. So let's pray and then we will take communion together. Father, I thank you. I thank you that we've learned it's not the working one who gets justification. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Let everyone be able to say that. Ken Murphy believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And I thank you, Lord, that it's not by circumcision. It's not by being a denomination or being baptized or ha having communion that makes us right with you. I thank you that it's not by law keeping that we inherit the promise. I thank you that it's his law keeping, Jesus fulfilling it. God, I thank you that because of that, we can be certain of our rightness with you. God, let that fall like a water to a man in the desert. To some of those sitting here drinking law and mixing it with Jesus on a daily basis. God, set them free. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. Let them have that this morning. And I pray that we would all look away from anything in us and we would stare our eyes out at the beautiful one that we're going to remember now. Son of God who was a willing sacrifice for our redemption. God, make us create more love in our hearts for Him. And bless us together now as we remember this sweet thing. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray.